share with you. And Michelle always, because I, I stand here so seldom, Michelle gives me lots of notice, which can tend to a little bit of schizophrenia because as you, and normally how I prepare my sermons is I wander around and I see something or I read something and then I start thinking about it. And what does God say about this? That's the next thing. And then I go from there and then I find something else more interesting, you see. And so sometimes I get confused at the end of the day when I sit down to actually get all these thoughts together. And I threaten the, the worship group because um, Bronwyn very kindly um, gave me the, the worship songs at the beginning of the week, which are all my favorites, and then hoped that I would preach on those songs. So I've got to try and touch on those songs. If I don't, please don't. I'm sorry. But a, a few weeks ago, and for the life of me, I can't remember who said it or where I read it, but there was this discussion about the difference between a servant and a, and a bond servant or slave. And it, it just captured my imagination. Because I looked and I thought, Paul speaks in Romans 1.1, 1, 1, and it's not part of my scripture, but choosing to be a bond servant. So little uneducated me decided that she would look at the Greek. Now, it's not modern day Greek, all right? It's, it's what's commonly known as, as Hellenistic Greek or the Greek of, of, the, of the streets in the time of Jesus. So, of course, the Greek scholar is actually Michelle. So I didn't think I could actually phone Michelle and say to her, listen, I'm preaching, but I need you to tell me something because then she's going to get her spies out to check on my sermon. So then I asked Cedric, and Cedric kind of went, hmm, um, hmm, not a Greek scholar. So, okay. Then he told me to phone some dude up in Joburg who does his devotions in Greek, and I was too scared to. So I, I did the very naughty thing. I went to Kum. And I went and I found an interlinear English Greek Bible, New Testament. And the guy came up and he said, can I help you? And the book is like 800 rand. So I said, no, I'm just looking, thank you. And then quickly flipped through to Matthew chapter 20, verse 26 and 27, and looked at the Greek. And then went out the shop going to myself, because I'm old. Dulos Dakonos, Dulos Dakonos, different, Dulos Dakonos. Because then I could get onto the internet, you see, and then I could actually look and see what I was looking at. And you know, the thing was that the more I delved into it, the more scared I got about preaching a sermon. Because there is such a difference between servant and bond servant. And I want to look at that today, and then I want to ask us all the questions. Because I, I thought, oh, I'm not doing this first Sunday of the year, and it's a new year, and blah, blah, blah. Because basically, it's just tomorrow, and yesterday, and today. God has given us today, not tomorrow yet, and yesterday is past. I wanted to do something different, where we can say, okay, where am I going? Who am I in this walk with Jesus Christ? And so I looked at... Firstly, Matthew 20, verse 26. And sorry, I thought I could change the slides myself, but I can't. In this particular Greek, they use the word diakonos. And the, and the thing for diakonos is it's one who executes the commands of another. One by virtue of the office assigned to them by the church, cares for the poor, the sick, and others. And there was an aside there, and the money. And a waiter, one who serves food and drink. So Jesus says here, he says, But whoever will be great among you must be your servant. So I looked at the thought of a servant and I looked at scripture and I went, For the servant in the Jewish community, you served as that servant for six years. And on the seventh year, the year of Jubilee, and if you go into the book of Leviticus, and I'm not going to go into that because that's another sermon on its own, but every seventh year, everybody got freedom. If you bought land in, after six years, in the seventh year, you gave it back to that person. And so in the seventh year, the servant was given their freedom. So they were, although they were seen as Slaves and in, and in the, the 
household. There was no difference between the slave and the servant. And they were all supposed to be, according to Leviticus, to be treated well. They weren't. They were supposed to be treated properly. They weren't. They were supposed to have certain privileges. They weren't. They they had this thought pattern of freedom at the end of six years. So I can serve this person, and if they're not so great, I can move on, and I can go somewhere else. But Jesus, and they they could also, they could, when they went in their freedom, the owner had to give them livestock and food. So they weren't just put out there and said, oh, sorry for you, so that straight away they needed to look for a new master. They were given the potential to live on their own for a certain portion while they looked for another job. Sometimes more than what companies give people today. I suppose a little bit like your severance package or your unemployment. You don't have to go and find a job immediately. You can wait at least two months, hopefully, find another job. But Jesus goes on. And he says, whoever would be first among you must be your slave bondservant. And the word used here is doulos. That is one who gives himself up to another's will. Those who serve um, as services used by Christ and extending and advancing his cause, a slave, a servant attendant. So they look pretty similar. They look pretty similar. But to become a bond servant was a choice. Or you got into debt to a person. And so I owe CNA 5,000 rand for the money I spent at Christmas, or maybe I should say Absa Bank, for the, for the money I spent on my credit card. And I don't have the cash to pay Absa Bank. So I go to Absa Bank and I say to them, I will work for you for nothing until I have paid off this debt. Choice, kind of. But at the same time, people were captured. Same thing. Things were not done in the right way. People were made bond servants. This was for life. Unless the master chose, in fact, I shouldn't have said to Abs, I should have just said, I will work for you. And then ABSA would come because they can't bank. Um, and they would say, after you've earned your, you know, you've paid your debt back, you can actually go. But the way that they used to differentiate between the servant and the slave was that they used to take an awl. That's a piece of bone, which is probably what was used in Old Testament and New Testament times. Because, you know, I looked, I looked on the internet for all, and I found all these fancy ones, you know, with the metal hooks and the wooden handles. I went, mm, no. And they would take that, and they would put your ear against the doorpost of the house, and they would stick that all in. And that would be a symbol that you now belonged to that household. And you would have that hole in your ear for the rest of your life. Now, I found it very interesting while I was looking at this because there is a group in America, and I think about my pierced ears, lady. We're going to get the men to pierce their ears. You know, we go and we get our ears pierced because it's pretty, or we've got somebody gave us some nice earrings and they pierced ears or something like that. But there's a group in America who pierce their ears and put a cross in it as a symbol that they've chosen to be a bond servant to Jesus Christ. So I'm, I'm very much a, like a tactile, visual person. Um, so I kind of think this is quite nice when I'm pulling my ear. Then instead of going, ouch, it's sore and I don't want these earrings in anymore, it's ouch. I become a bond servant to Jesus. What does that mean? So I even considered, and I might do it still, of going and getting another hole. So if you see me with a hole with a cross dangling down, you know that I've been bold enough to go and do it. But I have terrible skin that that reacts to everything except like very expensive gold earrings. So my husband goes, yeah, whatever. I need a really expensive gold earring to put in my ear. The the thing is that that they were honorable and trustworthy. 
whether they were or not, they were meant to be. They were totally committed to that household. And they had no rights to leave. The servant, after six years, could leave. The bond servant had no rights to leave. Unless the master came along and said, I am giving you your freedom. You have been a really, really good uh, bond servant to me. You've been a really good doulos. I'm giving you freedom. And then they could choose whether to stay or to leave. A servant, and this is where we get to us, a servant could choose after six years to become a bond slave. And then he would have the all put through his ear. And he was committed to that master for life. But what, what is, what, what does God expect of us? Because the question is, and, and the question we all need to ask ourselves, are we a servant for Jesus Christ? Or are we a, let me call it slave, because otherwise you say bond servant and it sounds pretty. Are we a servant for Jesus Christ or are we slaves for Jesus Christ? What have we chosen? We've got to the end of, of a year and, and you know, it's, it's like frenetic and it's ridiculous and, and it's, it's silly and, and we get to the point where we're just going, oh, please, peace and quiet. Let me just have a break. Let me just have a breather. But there's this question hovering. It's hovering over me. I want to hover it over you, like the sword of Damocles. I, I want you to ask yourselves, am I a servant or am I a slave? And so I looked at Philippians because they also use the word. And Philippians 2, verse 2 says, Then then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. This is what being a bond servant is all about. Because later on we will see that the, bond, um, the word bond servant is used here. So the first thing is, and I looked and went, like-minded, hmm. I don't know if I want to be like-minded with everybody. Ask the session. I'm often not like-minded with them. And I'm quite adamant about being not like-minded. So I don't think I like that one very much. Having the same love. Can we love everyone? Do we love everyone? Do you love that person next to you? That person that you sit with week after week after week next to you, do you love them? Do you even know them? One in spirit, one in mind. Not my mind. Not what I think. Oh, gee, Lucien, you better hold me accountable to this one, boy. Not what I think. What is God saying? Like-minded means, I forgot to write it down. <laughs> Like-minded means that we all have the mind of God. Like-minded. Are we all going in the same direction? Are we all headed towards the cross? Do we all have the same love for God? Some of us have journeyed with God for many years. I'm busy helping Michelle prepare a Lent program. And one of the questions was, do you remember when you gave your life to Jesus Christ? And I think you always think, oh, I'll remember that. But as you get a little bit more mature and a little bit more gray-haired, sometimes you kind of battle to remember. How did you feel? And I, I, I do remember Camp Jonathan with Emlyn Jones and Charles Gordon and um, Gordon Melrose at 16, offering my life to God. But do I have the same love for him at 64 as I had at 16? Do we? Or have we just got into, this is church, this is the habit, this is, the, this is what I do. I read my Bible, I pray, I come to church, I worship, I go home, and I, 
have lost my passion. Being a, a slave for Jesus Christ means that we need to have the same passion for him that we had when we were younger. The same love, the same like-mindedness. Because knowing the mind of God, we are filled with the same spirit. There's nobody better than anyone else. There's nobody different than anything else. And I I find it so interesting sitting in Bible study and and new believers or people who are, are finding their way back to God, apologizing for not knowing it all. We should never have to apologize for not knowing it all. Because let me tell you, the person who stands here knows as little as you. Learning just as much as what you are every day. Being reminded by people who are in a new walk with Jesus Christ that there are things that we've forgotten. There are things that we need to be reminded of. Verse 3, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility, value others above yourselves. That is just so not the world. That is so not what the world we live in. The world teaches us, you've got to be first. You've got to get it right. You've got to be in front of everybody. You've got to do it better than everyone else. We, we live in a complex, and in one of the other duplexes, there's this little girl who's just written her matric. And it's a family with three children and a mom and dad. So there's five of them, and the two girls, because there's two girls and a boy, the two girls have to share a bedroom, because it's only a three-bedroom um, complex, and whoever's been into, into my place, the, the bedrooms are not much bigger than Michelle's office, um, the two small bedrooms. And, and so the one day Colin happened to be speaking to the father, and he said, oh, you know, Demi's really battling because there's so much noise. You know, Noah's a kid, and he makes a noise. And Colin said, you know what? Here's a key to our, our flat. There's a desk upstairs. She must come in any time because she was going and trying to study in the car. She was going sitting in her mom's car trying to study. And she did. She came and she went and sometimes I wish she went because she was up later than we went to bed and we kind of felt we had to stay awake because, you know, she was still studying and eventually her, her, her sister would come down, knock on the door and say, Demi, mommy says it's time to come home. I think she was feeling sorry for the pensioners who, you know, at half past ten needed to go to bed. And anyway, she wrote her matric and she got seven distinctions and one percent short of an eighth distinction. But where I'm going with this, because her heart, and she's going, to be a, she's going to be a judge. She said she's going to be a judge one day. Determined young girl. I was talking to the father and saying, wow, congratulations, this is wonderful, la, 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 big story. And he's going, yeah, but you know, was everybody, the lady who two doors down stopped having alterations done for two weeks so this kid didn't have the hammering. And all, the, all these people in, this, in, the, in the community who, who supported her. But the mother is fuming. Why? Well, she should have been ducks of her school, and she wasn't made ducks of her school. And her mother is going to go to the school and going to complain. Because why? The world says, you must be first. You must be, you know, sorry, sorry about anything else, but my kid got 1% short. I don't know. I said, are you going for a remark, hoping they'd say no? And he said, no, no, Demi's quite happy. Demi says, no, she's happy with what she got. She knows where she's going. She doesn't need to be, how do you make, oh, sorry, you're not ducks now. You're going to be ducks. I don't know how they do ducks of school. Not quacking ducks, eh? But this whole world is saying to us, if you've got the biggest car, the best garden, the, the best clothes, the best education, that's what success is. And what does God say? Are you my bond servant? Are you my slave? Are you the one who's given your life totally? Do you value others before yourselves? And I often think this, and I've spoken about it often, if somebody walked in with a car, a car, an AK-47 now. Would I sacrifice my life to protect 
two children's lives? Or would I run and hope like hang they followed me? Do I take the person next to me's well-being and put it above myself? And we were talking in Michelle's office this morning and saying, we need to be aware of the person next to us. We need to be aware of those things that are happening in their lives so that we can put ourselves back and put them forward. Heartbreak in our hearts, disappointment that we don't share with others in this community, this like-minded community who love God equally because we're embarrassed to tell people that perhaps we are not as successful as what they think we are. Or that we have children who've rejected God straight out and out. What a load of rubbish. How can you go to church every Sunday? How can you read your Bible every Sunday? How do you know there's a God even? What a load of rubbish. We need as a community to be reaching out to people. Not just here, but in our complexes, in the, in the, in the, in the areas we meet. The, shop, the people, the, the, the shop assistants, who don't even get asked, please may I have any more. They just get told, give me that. Give me that donut. The people who work behind the counters, who take people's impatience and anger at at the world and the way the world puts pressure on us and are rude to them, but they need to earn money. Are we bond servants when we go out? Are we bond servants when we drive our cars? Are we bond servants when we shop, when we deal with other people? Skip over the next one, Sean. In Philippians, it says, and it gives us an example of Jesus Christ. He gave up. He gave up being God to become fully human. He felt the pain, the rejection the anger of people. He felt the hatred of his own nation. He was left by others, by people close to him who couldn't follow him. He became a bond servant to the plan of salvation that God had planned from the very beginning of time. He never gave up. He kept going Until death. Until death. He gave up everything. Are we willing to give up everything? Are we going to be servants this year that does the work they are required to do? I've done my stewardship form. I don't have to do any more. I've done it. I'm 70, I'm 80, I'm 60. I've I've done it all. Don't need to do it. There's somebody, the younger people, you know the story. The younger people must take on the responsibility of doing church. And Aaron said, you never, ever done with the responsibility of doing church in his own way. I don't have to do tea duty because I've done it. I don't have to go to Bible study because I've done it. And I'll pray when I want to because I've done it. And then I'll give Pam all the people to pray for so I can walk away and go, that's good. I got the prayer group praying. I don't have to now. That's, that's, the, that's the, the servant. The servant who says, I'm here, you're lucky, I'm here, I'm sitting in my seat. You should be sitting in other seats to find out who's next to you. This little row here, always sit the same. This little row here. 
little row there. Time to change. Find somebody next to you that you don't know. I'm watching. I watch from the back. Have I done my thing? Have I, have I, am I, I'm quite happy to be a servant. God is saying, no, 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 no. I want more. Oh, please, God, you know. I, I do read my Bible and I pray for 10 minutes every day. What more do you want? I want you. I want you. I want, and I remember doing this with, with the youth one time. We did this, this house. You take a house and you think of a house and you walk in, you let Jesus into the entrance hall because nine times out of ten it's nice and neat and tidy. You let him into the dining room because hopefully you all are back on diet from this week. Those of us who are banting are back to banting. All right? So you let him into your dining room because we do say grace around the table and we eat nicely and we eat good food. I'm not so sure about the lounge because there might be a few TV programs there that are not quite too good or magazines or books. So I'll clear the lounge quickly before I let him in. But I'm not going to let him into my attic because in my attic are all the things I'm not proud of. The things that I've use bad language for because I've just been so frustrated. The the comments I've made about other people because I feel irritated or jealous. The things I've done that I'm not proud of because I, I wasn't as kind to somebody in the queue, shopping, driving, taxi drivers. They love God just as much as we do sometimes, especially when they put on the back of their taxi. I love Jesus. Cut you off. Good one. I love Jesus too. The crime, the hatred, those things we store away we don't want Jesus to see. God is saying, I want those. I want them. Because by giving them to me, you can be my bond servant. By giving them to me, by giving me your whole life, your, your thoughts, your actions, your words, your belongings. I don't want to give God my family just in case he does something to attract the attention that's not going to be very nice. So God, you know, let my daughter find salvation, but don't touch her or her family or me or, you know, all, all the siblings. So I don't want to give them, I don't want to give them my family. Have you given him your families with all their warts and their things and their whatever they do or don't do? One servant serves by self-sacrifice, giving up self for God and others. Amen. Our offerings for God's work will now be received.